So when you just uh, look at this uh, list of particles, you don't necessarily see anything missing. So you know, like you have neutrons and protons, which explain the which are part of the atomic nucleus. You have these pions, which will explain how those neutrons. The hope is <laughs> they will. This will somehow be integral part of explaining how neutrons and pi, uh, protons are bounded together. And um, you have electrons, which um, explain all the electromagnetic interaction. And um, you have neutrino, which explains uh, kind of which explains all the features of uh, the beta decay. Let's see. Um, I guess. Uh, if you are just staring at this list, you might wonder, like, what is this muon doing? Like, muon doesn't seem to be serving any function. It's just a, uh, it's just a kind of unstable version of electron, unstable, heavier version of electron. But all right, we don't know what this really is, but uh, like, what function it fulfills? But it's there, so it's in our list of things we know, and we know about photon. So um, this is a sort of where particle physics stood in the 1940s after the discovery of pion. And um, this is where I say, you would be excused for thinking that um, this is the, our complete or complete-ish knowledge of the world. And all that's remaining is to fill in the gaps. Um, you sometimes hear these quotes about like a patent office director saying everything that can be invented has been invented. That was the typical attitude um, around the end of the 19th century. And then maybe quantum mechanics just shook them up a little bit. But then around like 1930s, 40s, you could be excused for falling into complacency that you've discovered everything there is to know. Chemistry is explained in periodic tables. Quantum mechanics explains chemistry. And this explains kind of, or you think it'll explain um, everything there is to know. And what I will show you now is how the huge paradigm shift from that view, that um, that from that <laughs> somewhat arrogant uh, viewpoint of we know everything there is to know in the world. Uh, if you talk to any proper particle physicist, what we know even better today is what we know for sure that we don't know, that our theories are deficient. That's part of the joke about your last reading question. <laughs> um, uh, so, so we know more than what we knew in the 1940s. And one of the things that we know is that our theories are missing something. So I will just uh, kind of explain how the journey that we came to it. So I think I kind of showed you where people, the context to where the pions and muons were discovered. They were discovered in cosmic rays, right? Um, so I guess I'll just. Uh, Cosmic rays. I need a figure that has all the correct um, correct uh, um, letters. I don't think this has all the correct letters. Um, just the one of them with the correct letters. Mm. I guess they are showing. <laughs> One second. Um, so what I'm looking for is the particle that they discovered. Um, I guess. Is this any good? Not really. Um, all right. So what I'm just going to have to do is I'll just have to talk through it. Because no, no, OK. This one, this one has more of what I want. So I'll use this diagram to kind of um, explain what I'm talking about. So open image in new tab. OK. Then maybe zoom out a little. OK. So, um, so before the development of particle accelerators, cosmic rays were the main source of these exotic new particles. In fact, in this list, muon and pions, they don't, um, they don't naturally stick around because muon lives only for microsecond. Pions live only for 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 10 seconds. So the moment you make it, it's gone. So they ha all have to be produced by some reaction for you to study them with. Today, we do it with the particle accelerators. But 
back then, before you knew about these particles, <laughs> you wouldn't build the particle. Uh, like if you didn't know they existed, you wouldn't build particle accelerators to look for them. So um, back then, the source of these unstable particles was the cosmic ray, and what it's describing is, uh, actually, I don't know what it's describing. Let's just imagine there's a very high energy particle coming from the outside of the atmosphere. It's protons, helium, nuclei. And when it impacts the atmosphere, it produces a bunch of um, shower of secondary rays. Some of them could be alpha rays. Um, I don't know what these uh, represent. Some of them could be pions that we talked about. Um, and some of those, um, and some of these pions decay into muon. And um, so people were uh, taking their detectors up to the top of the mountain and kind of looking at the tracks to try to identify, are there any new particles? You know, these are something new. Let's see if there's uh, something that we haven't seen before. And this particle represents um, um, a particle that they had not seen before. It, you know, I don't know what their early name is. Today we call it K-meson. So this is the particle that we call K meson or K ion today. And it comes in, uh, it, well, it comes in four varieties. <laughs> it, um, there's the charged K ion, positive and negative. So this is showing the negative K ion. And um, there's two kinds of neutral K ion. Um, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit because I'm telling you what people figured out after a long time. There's a, uh, I guess the proper way to label them is there's a neutral K ion that's produced, and there's the antiparticle of this neutral K ion. And somehow, even though it's electrically neutral, the antiparticle is different from the particle. Um, so, so this is uh, yet another new particle that people discovered. And um, I guess if we are still being historically correct, the proper question to ask is, how did they know it was new? Like, um, what, what, um, what made them think that the tracks that they were seeing weren't um, just, you know, another pion? Or another, um, you know, the other, just the, uh, you know, the uh, tracks of uh, other part, other unstable particles, muons and pions that they have already seen before. And I guess the for the for the quickest explanation of how they would identify it as a new different particle is to its property. So when they measure its mass, or you know, more likely charge to mass ratio, and assuming that it has only a maximum, most one charge, um, they can kind of infer what its mass should be. When you look at the property of, oops, not the correct way. When you look at the property of the K meson, it's heavier. So you saw that for pions, its mass is about 140 MeV per C squared. The K ion is the, I think, the next heavy particle. So wait, not that one. Uh, Ada is kind of, uh, I'm just going to ignore Ada. It's not very interesting. All right, those are all, okay. Those are all excited states. I'm just going to skip through them. <laughs> I'm going to get to KMS on soon enough. Um, all right, Ex still excited state. Um, still excited state. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the problem with using the unabbreviated reference source. It's like going through a dictionary. You have to flip through a bunch of words that you don't care about to get to the key root words you want. All right, those are, once again, all excited states that I don't really care about. Uh, there's a way they organized this book, which is not how I want it organized right now for historical purposes, but we'll come back to that. Um, well, I didn't know there were that many excited states. Okay, here it is. <laughs> so these, um, we call them, so they acquired this uh, nickname that they were the strange mesons. Um, so the first hint that it's a, a different kind of meson is its mass. It's about 500 MeV. 
So it's definitely heavier than pi ion. So that alone would have identified it as a different kind of meson. So all right, let's just keep adding to this list that we have. So on top of the pi ions, we know the K meson, K positive, K minus, and then neutral K meson, and then neutral K meson, the antiparticle of neutral K meson. So the very first thing that um, once again, is that it's uh, heavier. The second thing that um, people realized was very strange, which is why it's now called, uh, you know, that it's why where it got the name, it's strange meson, is its lifetime. It's much longer lived than the pi meson. It's kind of hard to see with the charged version because charged version lives for 10 to minus eight seconds and that's sort of how long the charged pi mesons live. So, all right, that's not all that strange. But you notice that it's strange when you look at the neutral K meson. So when you look at the neutral K meson, once again, scrolling down, 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 down. How far do I have to go? Uh, okay, when you look at the neutral, Am I looking at both? Okay, okay. When you look at the long-lived neutral K meson, do they not? That's the short-lived one. Wait, where's the long-lived one? Okay. <laughs> when you look at the long-lived component of neutral K meson, which is what you would have remaining after 10 to the minus 10 seconds, it lives almost as long as the the charged K meson does. And when you refer back to the pi meson, you would see that, oh, that's not the case for the pi meson at all. When you look at the, um, when you look at the pi meson, there's a definite lifetime difference. The charged one lives for 10 to minus eight seconds, and the neutral one, it lives, wow, it's a lot shorter than I thought. I don't know why I thought it was 10 to the minus 10. 10 to the minus 17, is that right? Oh, okay, I misremembered. Anyways, but you agree it's still strange <laughs> that the neutral pi meson somehow is, lives only for 10 to the minus 17 seconds, but the neutral K meson lives, so whichever version you look at, the short-lived version or the long-lived version, it lives at least 10 million longer. It's, uh, the, I read this somewhere as I was doing the particle physics thing. It's as though you came across a village of people and people in that village were living to be, I guess, a billion years old or something like that. If you saw that, then you would think, oh, somehow biology of whatever's happening in that village is different. So with the K meson, that's what scientists, what particle physicists realized as they were studying the properties of this K meson that it's a so much longer lived than the other comparable mesons. So they gave it a um, title, Strange, <laughs> and that name stuck. Um, through the other um, kind of more refined theories we'll go through, the, um, the idea of, uh, idea of uh, what they call, so you can kind of see it here, the idea of a strangeness which is denoted by this, which is denoted by this S parameter that'll stick through. And this is around the time when physicists learn to become more whimsical and <laughs> so that's the strange method. Um, 